On the morning of August 7th, Dragowinds woke up to a bizarre sight. Overnight, the Animus River had transformed from midsummer clear green into bright orange. Two days earlier, three million gallons of wastewater had blown out of the long-abandoned Gold King Mine, located deep in the San Juans. And within three weeks, a golden ribbon had snaked through four states, putting the region's safety agencies into crisis management mode, making international news headlines, and inspiring comment from presidential candidates to talk show hosts. Gold mine in the Animus River. Now the, river the Environmental Protection Agency quickly accepted responsibility, but they were only the last player in a long chain of events leading up to the spill. We'll have a look at the history of 19th century mining in the San Juans, We'll also learn how Fort Lewis College responded to Gold King with scientific skill and professional expertise. Lastly, we'll talk to Durango City Councilor Sweetie Marbury about the indomitable spirit of Durangoans as they return to their beloved river. All in this episode of Fortifact, the old King Gold Blues. The Gold King Mine started as a procrastination. Claimed in 1887 by pioneering miner Olaf Nelson, who died before he could work it, the mine was sold to a partnership in 1894. The resulting dig revealed a vein of gold so rich that the mine became the most important in the region, operating until 1923. The Animus River corridor is dotted with over 5,000 such abandoned efforts a legacy of 19th century attitudes regarding the land, patriotism, and industry. Well, the San Juans were one of the great mining districts in the whole United States to start with. And the first miners were in there in 1860-61, but the Civil War stopped them completely. And so in the 1870s, they come back in, and that's when they discover most of the big veins that are, that are up there. Mining gets started, and of course, in, in the 19th century, mining was really in, because what opens up the area, what settles the area, what pays, uh, and what calls attention to the area, it's mining. Now, the 19th century felt that they were opening up the West, they were bringing settlement, they were making money for themselves and for the country, and so they weren't concerned about the environment, they weren't concerned about what might happen in the, in the long run, because this has been always been the way. Uh, I think people just need to understand it. You've got to put on, on your 19th century hat to grasp why this happened and how it could have happened and how they didn't understand what might happen down the road, ramifications. Because what are we doing today? In which in 50, 75 years, people are going to say, didn't those people understand what they were doing? Well, we don't know. Well, the same is true of whether in the 1870s, 1900s, early uh, 19-teens. It seemed to them that everything they were doing benefited Colorado and benefited the United States, and therefore benefited everybody. On August 5th, contractors working for the EPA tried to pump the Gold King mine free of backed up water that they knew was inside. Believing the mine held around five feet of water, the crew cleared debris in front of the mine at it to insert a pipe. Over 12 feet of water was actually being held back by the fragile dam, and small leaks in the shaft roof rapidly collapsed into a massive blowout measured at over 1,200 gallons a minute. All anyone could do by that point was get out of the way. Shortly following the event, the Environmental Protection Agency offered a series of informational public meetings in Durango. The first of these sessions was a combative excoriation of the agency. Yet the reasons for the spill were literally a century in the making. Gold King, along with many other abandoned diggings above Silverton, sat neglected and leaking until the 1990s when the last of the region's mines closed. The EPA made a stab at naming the area a Superfund site, but opposition from Silverton residents derailed the designation. In 1994, a volunteer group of environmentalists, miners, and landowners known as the Animus River Stakeholders Group formed, and serious reclamation efforts began. 
By the early 2000s, fish had returned to the river below Silverton for the first time in a century. Unfortunately, the success was short-lived. A complicated three-way swap of properties in 1996 resulted in bankruptcy, lawsuits, violations, and state orders. The resulting confusion led to a return to pre-treatment levels of contamination and a boomerang of the EPA in 2008 as the only agency both willing and able to address the need. As the spill unfolded, FLC offered its expertise as a resource, including sociological impacts on the community and research on the Animus River floodplain. Although detrimental as a whole, the spill offered an amazing pedagogical opportunity for real-world research into its causes and effects. Long-term monitoring is not sexy because people are all more interested, funding agencies are often more interested in, you know, starting up a new project. And uh, it's hard to get funding to sustain long-term monitoring, and it's hard to get the personnel to keep it going over the long term. But that's something that a place like Fort Lewis can really shine at because we can use our, um, our classes and our students to keep going back out and collecting data. You know, if we've got a fairly simple data collection system set up, then um, I use my field ecology class. Uh, the biology department has a new curriculum, and in our new curriculum, ecology is now a course that's taught at the 200 level and we're uh, redesigning what we do and a third of that class will focus on uh, elements and element cycles and a component of that will be on metals, on heavy metals and the role and influence of heavy metals in the environment, how they move in the environment and where and how we sample them. So that will give students the opportunity to get very relevant training to the needs of our community and hopefully create an opportunity where some of them can get hired for jobs in, in different positions as we, we continue to be a community that um, I expect is going to keep investing a lot in, in river monitoring. One of the things we try to do in the geosciences, and, and I'm not saying it's just within the geosciences department, but I'm, I'm sure other departments do it as well, but is to uh, try and instill a service component with respect to uh, giving back. Um, they do their senior thesis, and one of the things they do along the way is a, we make them do <laughs> a service component. And honestly, they're very willing to do it. And it, it varies across the scale because it's always good to give back. And I think uh, a lot of the students were just completely on board with this. And they all wanted to be involved. Several other historic gold mines operated above and below the Gold King, all of which were abandoned and plugged by 1991. Although the mine shafts are not connected by any known man-made structures, recent testing reveals a mysterious hydrology, suggesting a relationship between them. Water pressure behind the bulkheads of the mines increases and decreases for unknown reasons, all the while leaking a constant stream of acidic water. Geology senior Anastasia Hedrick has created a three-dimensional digital model of the Gold King mine shaft as a part of her senior project. Her work offers a potential insight into the reason why the diggings were so full of water. So this is a 3D triangulation model of the Gold King mine. Um, right here you see all of the workings for the Gold King and this purple line is the American Tunnel which is 800 feet below the Gold King and not actually connected through man-made tunnels. Um, this is the surface of the Gold King, and this surface is not um, exaggerated. This is a view of what's called plan view, looking from space down on the surface. You can see the American Tunnel, which connects to the Sunnyside Mine over here, running underneath the Gold King and out chart, or outputting into Cement Creek here. That was a drainage tunnel. And then right here you have the grouping of the Gold King Mine workings, which again is not attached to the Sunnyside Mine. Um, I am going to, right now I'm putting in the major faults that run through the Gold King, the Bonita Fault and the Ross Basin Fault. So this is what's called a long section view of the Gold King Mine located up here and the American Tunnel, which mind you again is not part of the Gold King. This is the Bonita Fault and this is the Ross Basin Fault. 
through this image, we can see how the Bonita and Ross Basin Fault intersect the American Tunnel along with the workings of the Gold King at level seven, level five, level four, and level three. These are conduits in which water can travel through. These are potential connections, natural connections between the Gold King and the American Tunnel. Anger, shock, and disbelief over the worldwide attention the spill garnered was a hallmark of community reaction in Durango. The incident inspired punditry from across the political spectrum, including Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper and presidential candidate Dr. Ben Carson, both of whom made an appearance. To the delight of gathered media, the governor even sipped a bottle of river water. But for all the media circus, those who lived in Durango and based their lives around the river felt a profound sense of loss. The extent of, of the impact varies by where you are and your economic base and your class and cultural background. So part of the work I think I can contribute is to try to show that variation and help understand why um, different sectors of the community might be um, moving in different directions when it comes to wanting to just feel like it's done and over with versus other real long-term hardship that should be addressed and have support. For me, recovery is a longer-term process and one way I think of getting there is to try to connect communities and break down the divides of state line or tri tribal and non-tribal or class divisions um, that are real present in our watershed and, and begin to have more of a, um, a, a bioregional connectivity between communities. So that's what I like to work towards. Well, Durango had a tough time. We had a lot of national publicity and a lot of inaccurate, incorrect publicity. But right now, to be honest with you, we're so happy to have our river back. And we are back to what the EPA calls pre-event um, data. You know, everybody was impacted by the, by the spill. Um, different levels of impact, whether it's um, economic for the community, whether it's um, you know, related to an emotional response, um, you know, seeing the the spill come through um, obviously triggered a lot of different emotions. As the river gradually returned to a glassy green, tempers subsided. Testing showed the spill had not damaged the waters as badly as had been feared. No die-offs of fish or even small aquatic invertebrates were found. You know, there's not, there's not huge human health effects. Um, there's an effect on the aquatic system uh, due to precipitation of these metals. Um, and uh, that's an effect that's been going on for, for decades uh, due to the fact that we have a highly mineralized area upstream. The process of recovery will be a long one for some. For others, the recognition that the animus has always been a mineralized waterway brought closure. Yet the community has grown through undergoing a crisis. Durangoans learned a great deal about their environment and their history. But perhaps more importantly, they learned why they needed to know. By August 14th, the river was reopened to boaters. Four days later, the Durango River community responded in typical Durango fashion with a river parade. And with a deepened appreciation for the fragile artery that runs through the heart of the San Juans. Well, we've all been pushed around From here and now to the school ground 
Left our hearts in the lost and found Cause we've all been